to day 9 of 365 days of the NES. Today we are looking at Destiny of an Emperor, uh, made by Capcom, released in the US in 1990, but uh, created and released in Japan in 1989. In the era known as the Latter Han, the people of China were plagued by a bandit horde called the Yellow Scarves. They searched for a hero, 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 hero. They searched for a hero that could amass a force strong enough to conquer these cutthroats and thieves. At the time, three men were separately gaining power by attaining the service of many warlords. They each planned on ridding their country of the yellow scarves. But when that task is finished, there will only be room for one emperor. Return to a time of sword and honor, where an oath was signed in blood. Master the strategies in this role-playing game for the NES. So, oh, Destiny of an Emperor. Um, if not the first RPG made by Capcom, one of the first. That's right, it wasn't Breath of Fire, it was this. Destiny of an Emperor, um, also known as The Devouring of Heaven and Earth. It is loosely based on the... Um, Romance of the Three Kingdoms novels, which all take place in ancient China. And the game is based on a manga uh, called Tenchi Wo Kurao, I believe. Um, follows the story of Liu Bei, Zheng Fei, and Guan Yu, who form a small militia to defend their village from the Yellow Scarves, who are called the Yellow Turbans in some translations. Um, basically, it's um, kind of a Dragon Warrior-esque RPG in which we wander around defeating enemies, raising funds, buying equipment, recruiting generals, and uh, liberating strongholds. The game is split up into could call them different chapters. It is a very, very long game. Um, and has a huge number of playable characters. 150 in all. That is a lot for an NES game. That's a lot for most any game. The gameplay is... While some will say unlike any RPG, I will say it's similar to some RPGs. Um though there are some differences. Um, you have non-boss battles, i.e. random battles in Destiny of an Emperor, but you do not specifically run into generic units in these boss, or excuse me, random battles. You can actually run into generals randomly who are roaming the, the Chinese countryside in uh, various areas and whether you pay them off, give them a gift of a very good horse, or just convince them through charisma, if you want to call it that, to join you, they will uh, join your group. As I said, there are 150 playable characters in all. Sadly, mm, a large majority, we're probably talking 85, 90%, never level up with the rest of your units. So, most of them end up being pretty useless and you end up replacing them very quickly. While there are 150 playable characters in all, you are only allowed to carry up to 70 characters at a time, which hang out at a uh, eatery, much like in um, Dragon Warrior 3. Once you have maxed out your list of generals, you can only recruit more by basically firing some of the old ones. Your active party consists of seven members. Um, of that seven, only five will actually participate in battle. One is a replacement for anybody that happens to be killed. The other is a tactician. The tactician provides basically the magic for this game. The magic system in this game works similar to how it does in uh, Super Mario RPG, you could say. The entire party shares an MP bank, which is tactical points in this game. Tactical points are learned and powered up as your characters level up. All of the generals have different stats, which basically include strength, hit points, and intelligence. 
And while any general can be made a tactician, not every general actually learns tactics that you can use. This is where things get a little interesting in this game. You may have a tactician who has very, very high intelligence, which means his tactics will work majority of the time. But you may not want to use him as your group's tactician, because if he is the tactician, he won't get to participate in battles unless you specifically take a group of five generals, which is not recommended. It is always nice to have an extra two generals, even if just to be extra inventory space. Your characters do have a limited inventory in this game. Anybody can use tactics in battle, as long as you have a set tactician who assigns the tactics. Some generals, those with higher intelligence, are going to be better at it than others. Some generals who have really, really good strength, you're not going to want to have them use tactics as much if their intelligence is low. Makes sense, right? Right. Another thing that makes this game a little more interesting is your hit point stat. While it is indeed the health of your general, it actually reflects the number of soldiers under that general's command. So a general who has hit points of 136 is actually leading 136 soldiers. Once that number reaches zero, the general is considered defeated and has to be resurrected, which you can only do by buying a resurrect item at the item shops. Not too bad, really not any different, but the amount of damage you deal is dependent on the number of soldiers that the general commands. That general that's commanding 130 soldiers will do less damage than he would if he was commanding double that. It's not a huge difference, but it is a noticeable difference. As your generals lose health, they will deal less damage. Same thing with the enemy generals. Equipment needs to be purchased. Weapons, armor. Uh, another thing you need to keep track of is your rations. You want to make sure you have enough food to feed your army. If you don't, they basically end up with... You could call it a poison type status, where after every few steps they will lose a little bit of health as your soldiers are not able to provide for themselves. Final interesting bit about the battle system in this game is the all out command in which you basically hit all out, it goes into auto battle where your characters will not use any tactics and just physical attack pretty much however the uh, AI decides they should attack. However, you will not use tactics in this situation while the enemy still is able to. This is probably one of the most overlooked games on the NES. It is a huge game. It spawned a sequel also on the NES. Um, it is very fun. It is very challenging. The music is great. The story is very good. The puzzles are excellent because there are some puzzles um, it's hard but it is very fun uh, the average rating on this game goes between a seven and a half to eight out of ten it's very very much worth your time to sit down and pick up and play especially if you're a fan of the Dynasty Warriors games or the Romance of Free